I'm trying to have people react to the work on an aesthetic basis by affording them an entry uh, that is completely that is completely different from the normal uh, normal entry to a piece of sculpture. I don't give them a man on a horse which they can look at uh, this piece of bronze and remember some general. I give them like a toy so that they enter into the toy and after they uh, do something kinesthetic with it, then they can begin to look at it because then they're searching. If they search to look for it, then there's a chance that they may find what the artist intended. So Mark DeSubero created Bygones in 1976 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And shortly thereafter, he moved it to a hillside that was adjacent to his studio in Petaluma, California. Dominique de Manil uh, bought the sculpture only two years later um, through the dealer Richard Bellamy. And uh, when she bought it, Dominique said the most beautiful thing about the work. She said, Marc de Suvero's Bygones is one of the great sculptures of its time. She said, ever since I bought it for the Manil Collection, I've wanted it to premiere here for the occasion of the opening of the Manil Collection Museum. So despite the strong desire, uh, she actually allowed the work to be uh, exhibited in 1985, uh, two years before the museum opened, uh, for a major exhibition of the artist's work at Storm King in New York. That said, uh, the sculpture as it stands now was installed uh, in 1987 and that was the year the museum opened. So it had a sort of wonderful premiere here in Houston on the occasion of the museum's opening. Initially installed on concrete pads, over the past 30 years, the sculpture slowly subsided below grade, resulting in frequent submersion of its base in rainwater and an increased rate of corrosion there. Years of rainwater accumulating atop the welded fin, securing the I-beam to the plate, created an additional localized area of accelerated corrosion. So the most recent treatment was designed to address aspects of the installation and construction that we knew were contributing to the sculpture's deterioration. Since the treatment required us to disassemble the work for the first time in almost 30 years. We also recognized that it was going to be a great opportunity to examine and treat surfaces that are normally hidden from view, um, like those interfaces that um, are between different components. Because these areas are extraordinarily hard to access and monitor, it was particularly important for us to take preventive measures against corrosion as part of our treatment. This project required collaboration with a whole team of professionals, including conservators and conservation scientists, riggers, radiographers, engineers, metal workers, and concrete and landscaping contractors. The first step in the treatment involved confirming the alloy composition of the various pieces of the artwork to make sure that anything we used in the course of the treatment would be compatible and not inadvertently accelerate the corrosion. Next, we washed the piece to remove built-up surface dirt. When that was done, we prepared for deinstallation by loosening and retightening the bolts that secure the components. Given that they'd been in place and exposed to the elements for 29 years, a significant amount of coaxing was necessary in some cases. In addition to brute force, some bolts required the use of torches or even cutting wheels to free them. Two cranes were required to support the components throughout the disassembly process. Uh, the most challenging part was definitely removing the I-beam from the keyhole in the slanted plate. The tight fit there meant that if the riggers didn't precisely balance and smoothly manipulate all of the multi-ton components, there was a risk that they would bind. Or even worse, they could have scraped and gouged each other as they were pulled apart which would have destroyed the patina that has taken three decades to develop, not to mention the underlying metal. Once it was safely dismantled, the components were temporarily set up in an area just to the side of the installation site where they were individually treated. The integrity of the steel and all the welds um, was first confirmed through both radiography and magnetic particle inspection. The corrosion products, still clinging to the steel in some places, were removed with hammers, torches, and abrasives. 
because these porous corrosion crusts tend to collect moisture and they fuel further oxidation of the intact steel below. Next, the interfaces and any surface that contacts the ground when the artwork is assembled um, were coated with a coal tar epoxy and that's something that's normally used in the marine industry. Uh, this protects them from the elements and reduces their rate of corrosion. In addition, a small weep hole was added to promote drainage in a spot on the sculpture that tended to collect water and had therefore suffered heavy corrosion. So while the work on the sculpture was being completed, the installation site itself underwent significant changes as well. A survey of the site done by civil engineers indicated that the sculpture needed to be raised about 12 inches to encourage drainage of rainwater away from the sculpture. So the two foot deep concrete pads that were poured in 1987 for the initial installation were replaced with much more substantial 10 foot deep bell bottom piers um, that additionally have a larger overall footprint. These should better support the weight of the sculpture in Houston's play rich soil and will also direct the rainwater uh, that sheets off the sculpture further away from where it contacts the ground and that should prevent erosion and trenching directly around the sculpture. Um, the new footings also have galvanized steel caps that are finished with a zinc rich paint and these caps have actually several functions. They provide an additional barrier between the sculpture and wet surfaces while serving as a form of cathodic protection. And that just means that if conditions become ripe for corrosion, the footing caps will corrode instead of the steel of the sculpture. Also, the largest of the steel caps is tied into a long section of copper pipe buried below, and that serves as a ground in the event of a lightning strike. The assembly of the sculpture essentially followed its dismantling, but in reverse except that a brace is built to hold the angled plate component in the right orientation during the tricky step of feeding the I-beam back through the keyhole. Once it was through, new bolts were inserted and tightened, and the remaining more vertical I-beam was moved into alignment and secured. The final steps of the project uh, related to adjusting the grading of the site so that the piece once again assumed its original stance, appearing to sit directly on top of the ground. In addition, the drainage away from the sculpture was improved with a system of drains and perforated pipe, and an irrigation system and new sod were also added. The way that this sculpture relates to the ground is an important part of the experience of it. If the viewer is too aware of the footings, or if the sculpture looks like it's sinking into the ground, then the sense of casual balance that it's meant to convey, the sense that you just happened to cross it in the park, is lost. So in designing this treatment and working with the artist to do so, our aim was to regain the installation aspects that had initially made this sighting so compelling 30 years ago, and hopefully to make some improvements that will help the sculpture withstand the next 30 with only minimal impact.